Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we are continuing our conversation of contracts and covenants. And we're going to be talking this week specifically about dispensationalism and evangelicalism and how the relationship of government and law and God's law, what that looks like <laughs> from an evangelical perspective. Before we started, I ask you what your experience with dispensationalism is, if any, because I don't know all your personal history by a long shot. Would you want to repeat some of what you said and amplify on it to give us some context? Sure. Yeah. So I was sort of brought up dispensationalist, um, only in the sense that I thought that was the default view of Christianity. That's how my mom was brought up, and my mom chiefly taught me the Bible. And so it wasn't until I started listening to more confessional Protestant voices, mostly Lutherans at that time, that I learned that amillennialism, A, was not a wacky, off-kilter thing, um, and I'll lump postmillennialism in with that as well. But that there were other views and other views that people who respected and honored biblical truth, you know, it wasn't a liberal thing to have a different view than dispensationalism. But then what really did in dispensationalism for me was learning about covenant theology and recognizing that dispensationalism isn't so much an eschatology as it is a way of reading the Old Testament, a biblical interpretation question. Yeah. Do you ask uh, also before we started or someplace along the line about how did all this come about? Well, um, interesting that you should contrast dispensationalism eschatology with dispensationalism as basically hermeneutics, because it sort of started as an ecclesiology. Back in the 18, early 1800s in England, people looked at the established church and said, well, this just isn't working, is it? The church is, uh, is gone cold. It's um, stale. It's lifeless. Nothing happening here. Nothing to see. So God's obviously moving along. We need to look back at the Bible and find out what's happening to justify this. Now, not every Christian in every age actually believed the Great Commission would be fulfilled, but it was kind of in the background of people's minds that maybe we should preach to the world and maybe something will happen there. And there were high points, particularly in Britain and America, during the missionary movement of the late 17 and early 1800s. But this this idea of, yeah, no, that's yeah, missions, sure, because here's, here's the things about missions. Sooner or later, missionary activity, evangelism and such, is going to bring that last soul into the kingdom of God. And when that happens, Jesus can come. Because the church, as it turns out, was really never what it was all about. God had a plan in the Old Testament. And now here's where that hermeneutic and covenant theology thing you were talking about. God had this, old, this plan in the Old Testament that involved establishing Israel as the ruler of the world, as uh, the nation through whom he would bring forth the Messiah and bring peace and justice to the planet, a uh, golden kingdom that would fill the world. But you know what? When Jesus showed up, they rejected him and it. Now, since God doesn't lie and God doesn't give up, God, as it were, switched uh, sales pitches for a little while. He, out of nowhere, instituted this thing called the church as a parenthesis in prophetic time. It wasn't, and this is, this is how the earliest dispensationalists wrote and thought. I'm not saying anybody believes this today. I hope they don't, but this is how it started. The church is a parenthesis, the prophetic clock stopped ticking at Calvary, and everything in the church age was wholly, completely unforeseen. God knows what he's doing, but we don't. There's no prophecies, nothing we can lie on. And God's going to do his thing with the Gentiles for a while and build this church thing in this age of grace. And when he's done, however soon or long it may be, when that last soul is saved, Jesus is going to come back and take the church off the planet. 
This came to be spoken of as the rapture. Rapture in itself is not a bad word. But what was different was this rapture involved only Christians living at that time, and it didn't in history. It wasn't the visible second coming. It became more and more described as a secret coming, a secret rapture mm. um, that would bring about a period of tribulation during which all the horrible things described in Revelation would happen. And then when that was over, then Jesus would return visibly in glory to set up the promised kingdom and Jerusalem will begin become the center of political and social rule. The temple will be, be rebuilt. The sacrifice was reinstated. And the glorious kingdom that God promised David and promised uh, Israel to the prophets. Then it'll, then it'll take place for a thousand years. And then finally, at the end of that thousand years, the final judgment will come, the final resurrection, and eternity begins. Now, what's happened here? is we just disconnected the church from everything in the Old Testament and from everything after the rapture. It's this little parenthesis where an awful lot of the Bible doesn't apply. And depending on who you're reading or who you're talking to, uh, the Old Testament's gone. Most Revelation's gone. Some would even say that most of Christ's ministry, since it precedes Calvary, is not immediately relevant to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sermon on the Mount is law, and we're not under law, we're under grace. Uh, the prayer of thy kingdom come, that's for the millennium. That's what Jews should be playing, praying during the tribulation period. But it's not a prayer for Christians right now. Uh, and, and so in order to make this work, uh, it was necessary to assume that the Old Testament must be taken very, very literally. Zion is always the mountain. The temple is the temple in Jerusalem. Sacrifices are the slaughter of lambs, goats, and bulls. Those kind of things. And um, the idea that these might be pictures of the new covenant, that there might be arrows pointing to Christ, that was just kind of ignored because that's not literal. And this, this as, as we move into the 20th century, late 1800s, early 20th century, these same people who were insisting that the Bible must be taken very literally here were, bless their hearts, also the ones who were standing up against liberalism and saying, mm -hmm. no, you want to take out the virgin birth, you want to take out the second coming, you want to take out six-day creation. And they stood firm, and, and God, uh, God blessed them indeed that in an age of great apostasy, they stood firm mm -hmm. on key doctrines of the faith. These became who we call fundamentalists. And that's how I first heard about dispensationalism yeah. is that it's if you can take the bible literally take it literally mm -hmm. where take it at its word it's a very earnest yeah. motivation <laughs> and the fear is that if you're not then you're leading toward liberalism so mm -hmm. amillennialism postmillennialism to other ways of looking at eschatology and covenant and interpretation were brushed aside as either well intended but ignorant or as playing footsies with the enemy because you're not taking the Bible literally if you're going to give up on a Jewish millennium and a Jesus literally sitting on the throne of David, then what else are you, going to willing, are you going to be willing to compromise? And it's been very hard in some cases for um, people who are not dispensationalists to confront that perspective without coming across as liberals. We're, we're, we're saying there are other solid hermeneutical ways of reading the Old Testament. And when you're dealing with prophetic and poetic literature, metaphor is okay. Imagery is okay. And in fact, if you go and read the New Testament and see how the New Testament interprets prophecy, that's exactly what it does. Mm -hmm. This is how the New Testament interprets the Old. Um, and so, but what we've been left with then is this slicing of redemptive history into sections. Now, we've talked about three. The, the Jewish economy, law, the age of the church, grace, and the future millennium, kingdom. The earlier books introduced some earlier ones we won't worry about right now. But for our purposes, this meant that the law and laws that God gave Moses have absolutely nothing to do with the church, not by uh, application or derivation or even showing us what God is like, because God was so different then and so we can't, except maybe reading between the lines and picking up some vague generalities about God and, and redemption, that's, and we don't find those in the law, of course, we, we have to skip that. And when Jesus 
comes and sets up his millennial kingdom, then then that's a good place for nations to have laws because Jesus will be there to enforce them um, directly. Let me read a little bit of Psalm two because this is a, a there's a expression here that shows up a lot or used to in dispensational circles. Uh, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their courts from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is killed but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now, from a dispensationalist point of view, what this means is that when Jesus comes back and sits on the throne of David in a rebuilt Jerusalem with a renewed temple and all of that, Israel back in the land and the Gentile nations all formally submitting to him as king, he will have a law. It will be God's law. And he will enforce it. He will enforce it by smacking down anybody who, who breaks it. He, they, they refer repeatedly to his iron or his um, rod of iron rule over the nations. See, the idea here is that even in the millennium, the nations aren't exactly converted. They obey Jesus because they have to, because he'll smack them down. He'll, he'll smash them. He'll destroy them if they don't. Because here, the gospel of grace really has no footing. And so dispensationalists are, are, are seeing some things to which there is some truth, but they're missing the heart of it. And it, it it's, has bad effects on both ends. They understand that a king ought to have laws, that laws ought to be enforced, and if people don't obey the laws of their king, then you, you, he doesn't have a kingdom anymore, and you don't have a king anymore. But then they, we come to the New Testament and to the church age, and they say, but Jesus, they'll go as far as say that Jesus isn't king. He's Lord of you if you make him Lord of your life, but he's not king of anything in particular until he returns. Mm. at the um, the second coming revelation not the rapture this by the way is why the pledge to the christian flag um at least some versions of it in some songs speak of jesus as our prophet priest and coming I mean, king i didn't even know there was such a thing as a, a pledge to the christian flag that seems yeah unnecessary I, you know, we'll <laughs> talk about that some other time you don't want to get me started on that one um <laughs> But coming king, it means he's not king yet. He'll be king when he comes back in glory, not, not at the rapture, but when after the tribulation's over and he descends at Armageddon to destroy the, the Antichrist and, and all his hordes, then he'll set up his kingdom, and then he'll be our king, king of the nations. And what they put with that is, oh, and then that's where all those optimistic prophecies come to play. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance, the innermost parts of the earth for thy possession. He'll have dominion from sea to sea, and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. They dwell in the wilderness, shall bow before him, his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents, the kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, and all nations shall serve him. Uh, and there are many like things in the prophets. The whole earth shall be full of the knowledge of glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spirits into pretty hooks. There's a lot of this in the prophets. But the, what dispensationalism, dispensationalism from the beginning couldn't get a hold of was, how could God possibly accomplish this with the gospel? Hmm. We've seen what the gospel does. We've seen it in England, later we've seen it in America. It doesn't do that. The gospel is a failure if that's how you're looking at it. Now, for what God intended it, it's fine. It saves a few souls now. Uh, it saves them for eternal relationship with God and Christ. It saves them for heaven. But this is not the burden of the prophetic message. That's still off in the future. And when Jesus comes back, he will impose God's law, but he'll impose it by force. So the kingdom will be successful when Jesus returns. 
but by force, not by grace. Grace is now, but kingship isn't. Kingship is in the future, but grace not so much. Now, as I said earlier, this is where dispensationalism began. Over the last I don't know, 20 years or so, we've seen major revisions to the system, and I, I trust they're still being revised. I don't know what dispensationalism looks like anymore. Uh, there are many. I can who, tell you that the dispensationalism that I was taught growing up sounded like nothing like that. Well, so. good. Yeah, because it's, <laughs> yeah. been, it's been changing. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think in large think, part, be, go ahead. Oh, just I think largely what it meant in in my context was knowing what the Bible said. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it wasn't like I went off and got a degree in dispensational yeah. thinking or anything like that. This was just mom teaching me the Bible. And these are the categories that it works with. And of course, the gospel in the way that my mom taught the Bible, Bible was first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the disconnect between Israel and the church was as clear as it would logically need to be for the system. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's one of those blessed inconsistencies where those who hold to this view have a much more gracious and correct gospel <laughs> belief than the system itself would which is not unusual for. where systems are concerned when right. you have a, when you have a, a a false or incorrect system and you try to impose on people who actually read the bible <laughs> more than yeah. they read the theologians mm -hmm. you're probably not going to get something that wacky for instance let me give you a, a practical example in a different direction though um because the church was an unforeseen parenthesis outside of prophecy, this, this, this was a key moment. It meant that there literally were no prophecies that had to be fulfilled before Jesus came back. So Jesus could come back any second. There's nothing we're waiting on. There's nothing he's waiting on, except his, if you have Calvinist leanings, I suppose, that last soul he wants to see uh -huh. one. But that's hidden in his heart. Um, there's nothing out on the on the playing field of history that he has to wait for. And so they spoke of the imminent second coming. And that's how they understood mm -hmm. imminent, that we're not waiting at anything. It didn't necessarily mean soon, although generally that's how people understood it. They would say he can come at any time. I had an interesting brief conversation with one of our teachers once upon a time and I tried to explain the difference. So he can come at any time. Yeah, so he can so he's coming soon. No, that's not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> any time could be a long way off. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be soon. But the point is nothing it gave this benefit to evangelism of Jesus could come tonight and you could be left behind. <laughs> but that's what the system said. What people heard was, well, you know, there are wars and rumors of wars. There are plagues and earthquakes. Uh, Russia's uh, gearing up in the north. Uh, Israel returned to the land in 1940. They kept finding things that if they weren't the fulfillment of prophecy, were real close. Like, <laughs> this isn't exactly the fulfillment of prophecy, but the moment the church is gone, it'll be that. Russia will become the northern power that invades Israel. The um, uh, European Common Union will become the revived Roman Empire. Um, Jerusalem, or the Jews in Jerusalem will rebuild the temple. It's just, it's all set. Technically, yeah, none of this is prophesied, but but we know what is. And boy, are things getting arranged for that moment when the church is gone and all that's going to happen. And so now you have the best of both worlds. You can say Jesus is coming back any second. I mean, Jesus can come back any time, but he's probably coming back real soon because all of the pieces are coming into position. Mm -hmm. And so any time no longer means any time. It means sometime real soon. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is because people didn't really buy, didn't understand the system. On the other hand, you have people who would read the Sermon on the Mount and say, this is Jesus' words. Of course we believe them. Mm -hmm. Even though the system questioned that. Believers who simply read the Bible, but this is Jesus talking. <laughs> Golden rule. I think we should be attitudes. Yeah, Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's okay. You know, mm -hmm. 
because as you and say, systems often, people are generally not as bad as the systems they claim to hold, <laughs> except when they are, and then they're dangerous. Well, there's also the problem of the confusion of law and gospel, mm -hmm. um, which is a sharp distinction, I think, sharper than should be in dispensationalism, as you've described its origins. So then as the evangelical church sort of went forward and started confusing these categories, you're able to sort of squish the Old Testament and the New Testament together and make room for reading the things that dispensationalism said there's no need to read anymore because their law, well, if we don't have the proper distinction between law and gospel, then what's the problem? We can read the whole thing. So it's kind of an <laughs> error that happens to work out more right than otherwise. Depending who you're talking to. Right. I can, that, I've heard it both ways. To my <laughs> mind. Uh, so that kind of brings us to what we are in fact talking about, which is uh, civil government, contract versus covenant. The Bible always speaks of civil government as something that's covenantal in the sense that God is in charge. God invented it. God ordained it. The powers that be are ordained of God. I mean, there's, there's nothing revolutionary in saying that. So God represents himself through particular people who are to enforce what? His laws. Now, we can talk about which laws and to what degree and with what penalties and all of that. Uh, the, the catechisms and confessions of the Reformation were very clear. The moral law of God. There was no doubt about that. Even Luther was very clear about this. Uh, they got to they got to enforce something. Now again, we can talk about not now, but we could talk about <laughs> okay, do the case laws play in the Book of the Covenant and restitution and death penalties? Let, let's just leave that out for now. The, the very simple question is: Is does the state enforce "Thou shalt not kill" because God says so? The triune creator of the universe says so, or because we have found it to be a pragmatically good idea, um, because it's socially beneficial, because I don't want other people killing me, so I probably shouldn't kill them. Uh, is there some other basis than the law that God has revealed in Scripture, some other kind of law that is not tied back directly to God? Now, at times, the church has opted for a natural law, which they've tried to identify with um, general revelation. That seemed to work for a while until the Enlightenment came along, followed by Darwin and Freud, and kind of laughed at the whole idea that there are any absolutes anywhere. Uh, and you look at our generation, it's pretty hard to find anything that anybody agrees on, things that we thought once thought were absolutely solid, mm -hmm. like... Can you tell the difference between a man and a woman? Well, legally, apparently, you're you're being biased if you can, and and things continue. And there are this the civil government. God gave it the sword. Romans thirteen says, God gave it to them. They bear the sword. Well, what do you do with the sword? You kill people. You don't tickle them. <laughs> you don't render education or Medicare. You could hit them with the blunt side, but only with the understanding is that's your first warning and the next one's going to be the pointy end. Uh, it is violence. The state is organized violence with a particular goal. And this also answers the question of why do we have to obey last year's government? How do we? Why do I have to obey a government I didn't vote for? Isn't it all about free consent and all of that? And, and the evangelical church really has nothing from the Bible to answer it with, because those kind of things, the Old Covenant's pretty clear about it. And if you read the New Testament in the light of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament light of the New, it's not that hard to put pieces together. But when you simply say, yeah, law, that's Old Testament, Old Covenant, not for us. Bring You mentioned the law at all, you're probably a legalist. Uh, we're, just, we're just preaching grace. Well, then how do you organize the government? Well, you don't, because... Jesus loses in history. The church is not here to change the world. You don't polish brass at a sinking ship. We're just That's the individualism too. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, you know, the faith is not hereditary. You don't pass it down from father to son. It's about each individual coming to Jesus and giving him his heart. 
And there is truth in yeah, that, absolutely, right. <laughs> depending on what you mean by that. Yeah. Faith is not hereditary. Faith is not hereditary. But it is passed from father to son. <laughs> yes. But it is passed by the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And God has put parents and pastors and elders and Bible teachers and nice old widows in the church who pray for you and you don't even know their names mm -hmm. in your life as part of this covenant thing we call the church, this bundle of life tied up with the Lord that will pass it on effectively uh, on God's timetable, according to God's decrees. So, and, and this is a good place to fall back on Trinitar good Trinitarian theology. Yes, the individual is important. Yes, the group is important. How do you draw the boundaries? You read the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no abstracting it. Well, the general principles, no, 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 no. The general principles don't work, first of all, because the Trinity is very mysterious, and secondly, because we're sinners and screw it up all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there is an individuality about Christianity. Absolutely. You have to come to Christ yourself by faith, and no one can do it for you, mm -hmm. and you can't do it for anybody. On the other hand, God ties us together in this, and I keep quoting the, the verse that uh, Abigail speaks in, um, First Samuel, bound up in a bundle of life with the Lord. I think that's one of the most beautiful descriptions of covenant ever. Mm -hmm. uh, it reaches, it reaches, pervades the whole thing. It's not just this decision or this catechism or this profession. It's a whole life tied to God. Uh, and to and, other people and as to well, other, because you had to, to hear the gospel well. from someone. Yeah. Um, God could have rained leaflets down from yes. heaven. And that's not how he chose to spread his word. Yeah. Uh, he could have written in flaming um, letters across the sky. He could have encoded it in our DNA so that one day we look down far enough, we'd say, look, it says Jesus saves. Huh, I wonder what that's doing there. <laughs> but he did not do any. Appar apparently, somebody dug down pretty far and found some kind of something that looks like a cross and said, see? Like, no, that's... <laughs> Yes, God has a sense there are of humor. Lots of things but <laughs> in the world that are shaped like crosses. <laughs> yes. Um, but so we, we have this tension of the modern evangelicalism with roots in dispensationalism that says it's about me coming to God in Christ. It's about me going to heaven. It's about me going to meet Jesus when he comes in, in, in the air. And yes, there'll be a lot of us that will be doing it. Isn't great to all have this shared individual experience? And there are a lot of a lot of um, old hymns that are kind of like that. They're not bad in themselves, but they do very much reflect the "It's me and all my family. It's me and all my friends. It's me and you know." And, and that's great that I'm going to get to see my friends, assuming I have any. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll get to see. <laughs> um, I, I do this now and then. I, I'm getting old enough that I start counting. Who's already in heaven? Who's actually going to be glad to see me? Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the the older Puritan type hymns were about the glory of the church and the transformation the church would receive, and how we all together, as the bride of Christ, will come into His presence and be all that we're supposed to be. And there's truth in both places. But you have to keep you have to keep going back to scripture to maintain that balance. Because mm -hmm. if you just pick one, you will go with that one and you'll fall off some deep end someplace or get trapped in some dead end alley where you can't you're you're stuck and your your faith languishes because you're not really seeing all that God's saying to you. Well, back to contracts and covenants. So since dispensationalism didn't have a biblical answer to civil government, did not see a need for one, did not think the Great Commission really was ever going to be fulfilled. The best you get is where the church is going to bear witness to all nations, not with any particular degree of success expected. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, we watch the world go to hell. We expect Satan to take over. We expect that every political intrusion of the church will get it slapped on the nose and will walk away embarrassed and, and think of the Scopus Monkey trial here, or the church's attempt to have creation taught in the schools or to reinstate prayer and Bible reading. It seems that every time the church tries to do something, it fails, which is just more evidence that that's not where we should be. And, and our brothers will look at us and say, well, it's well-intentioned. We're glad that you care. But what, you're, what you want is what Jesus is going to do when he comes back. In the meantime, 
We just need to witness and 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 win people to Christ so that Jesus can come back. Because we're not talking even about sanctification. We're simply talking about saving souls for heaven. Well, what if the, for the few dear souls who do want to get involved politically, what's left to them? Well, tra traditionally in America, what's been left to them has been John Locke and the American system. <laughs> and you get this elevating America, the Constitution, the Declaration, all of that, all of our political heritage, uh, seen as rooted primarily in Locke, uh, who introduced, was one of the Enlightenment writers who introduced um, compact or contract theology, Say that's it then. This, this is the best system. God providentially gave us this wonderful thing that's protected the church and, and our right to evangelize, to worship. So however it got here, it's, it's the best we got because you obviously you can't force people to buy into a political system when they don't believe in the religious underpinnings of that system. I mean, if we were to say, well, this is a Christian country and we're gonna, our laws are going to reflect the Bible, well, how about all the people who aren't Christians? That's not fair to them. Okay. Do you understand that whoever, whatever law system you pick is going to represent a philosophy of life, a worldview, a religion? A morality. And you, a morality. And you must pick one. You, it, it's not Christianity versus some neutral thing. It's Christianity versus anti-Christian alternatives even if they come dressed as sheep. And, and so um, we, I, I see people who kind of get this and then they, and they look at their churches and their churches are flying the Christian flag and the American flag. Mm -hmm. And they celebrate 4th of July with um, singing songs about how great America is. And there is properly discomfort. Like, that's not right. No, that's not right. But that's what happens in, if you're not going to derive your morality, your ethics from scripture, then you're going to get it from someplace. The 1950s, the antebellum South uh, colonies, the founding fathers, the whole principle, I don't know if you know the principle approach to education. I won't bore you with the details. But it started when do, two dear ladies um, became fascinated with our founding fathers and saw that there were certain character traits that they all seemed to have in common that enabled them to be such great men in that great era. So they went back and looked at their writings and found what the traits were. And then having found them, then they looked in the Bible to see if the Bible could lend support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems a little backwards. Yes, doesn't it? Now, I am not misrepresenting this position, for those of you who know the principal approach, because I used to work for one of the leaders in the movement. And I asked him point blank, this, this is, my understanding is this. Is this correct? He said, yeah, that's it. But what, that's what you're left with. You have, man cannot be amoral. We can claim we are, but we always act as if some things are right and some things are wrong. And the people today who hate Christianity the most are the same people who are trying to pass laws telling us that we shouldn't do certain things because they're wrong. They're hate crimes. They're vicious. They're mean. They're totalitarian. They're, they're fascist. Problematic. You got to serve somebody, as Bob mm -hmm. Dylan said. And once you admit that, that you're talking covenant again, because God's a covenant keeping God. Mm -hmm. He's not, he's, he's not an election. He's not, well, God, God's in the running. Shall we vote for him this season? Or shall we try something else for a while? The, uh, and, and here's, I, I suspect we're running out of time. So mm -hmm. back, back to the key point that we've, we've kind of circled around, but let me smash the nail down. Dispensationalists could understand how the church could survive the drift toward uh, latitudinarianism and coldness that it was experiencing in the in the 1700s and 1800s. And, and therefore, dispensationalists, the proto-dispensationalists, were ready to just declare defeat. The gospel didn't work. It didn't, it couldn't change nations. The only other thing would be Jesus to come here by force, which still, they, they realize, still would not change men's hearts. In other words, all that we can ever hope out of humanity is that a few people of their own free will will choose Jesus. Because nothing else works. Uh, there was one writer not long ago, well, not long ago, maybe 10 years or so, 
who wrote that even the millennium, even the kingdom age, is not the coming of the kingdom of God. It's just more proof that even if Jesus himself is here executing his laws in person, it still will not change people's hearts. Well, that's true if you're talking about external force. The wonderful thing about the gospel <laughs> is it reaches from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. Now, well, then why didn't it have more success? Because God wasn't done yet. <laughs> He also might measure success a little bit differently yeah, than you or I. Yeah, he, he may have more subtle plans, subtle, as Bugs Bunny would say. <laughs> uh, we want, especially in modern America, we want everything handed to us yesterday. Uh, we do want to be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease. <laughs> we, we do want, we want everyone to come to Christ tomorrow. And we, we want, want to be able to like see the electoscope goggles like, yeah. to see who's saved and who needs to hear the gospel so we can not waste our time preaching yeah. the gospel to people who won't believe. <laughs> Rather than say, you know what, God's made some incredible promises about the future of his church and the gospel and, and who will serve Jesus and about his present reign and that he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So it goes all the way to the resurrection at the end of time, or in the redemptive time. Those are there. It's just that it's that God's not doing it the way we want. And so we pout, we get discouraged, we flake out, we can't believe in anything that's going to go much beyond our lifetimes. I think a, a good question to ask a lot of young people, even older people, is do you think you're going to die? Uh, my generation, the answer would have been no. If you were a Christian, you did not believe you were going to die because uh, Jesus was coming back before the year 2000, probably 1981. The logic was the generation that saw Israel reborn in 1948 was not going to pass away until all these things happened. 48, 40 years on top of that, 1988, back off seven years for the tribulation period, 1981. So it was mathematically science still delivered <laughs> that it, more or less by 1981, Jesus would come back and everybody, and especially the younger people in that generation, especially those who just come to Christ and didn't know anything, were convinced that they weren't going to die. I mean, short of a car accident or something, they would not grow old and die. In fact, a lot put off getting married, going to college, getting real jobs, because there was no point. Jesus was coming back really, really, really soon. And if you did not believe that, you were a theological liberal. You were an unbeliever. And the the longer view, the view that built cathedrals, uh, was gone. And here we are, and we look at the world around us. And you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we thought things were pretty bad. We had no idea how bad they were going to get. <laughs> and you know what? They can get worse. <laughs> Ask the people who've come out of the former Soviet Union who lived through the Holocaust or the, those who live in Red China at this moment are those martyrs who die under the sword of Islam. It can get a lot worse. We just don't think it should happen in America because we're special. We don't get persecuted. We don't go through tribulation. That was another thing. Tribulation is not for the church. That's for Israel after Jesus takes the church out. The church will never see tribulation. That's why dispensationalism didn't sell as well in places like communist uh, Russia and communist China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reading church history helps. Mm -hmm. Roman Christians went to the lions. Reformation Christians were burned at the stake. Christians today, all over the world, are being martyred. And we think we shall escape because we're Americans? And we think that God's plan has failed because of that. <laughs> we're just really sissy and naive. Uh, we do not know how long. We do not know what the conditions are. We know that Jesus is already Lord and King, being God at all, having defeated sin. <laughs> yeah. There's that. Um, there's that, you know. And so having defeated sin and provided all that we need for the redemption of, of his people and of the planet, now we have to do what God has told us to do, which is to pray, worship, preach, evangelize, build godly families, godly institutions, and reach out to a dying world with, with hope. And then in his time, he will crown that with whatever blessings he sees fit. There is this thing called the Great Commission that was not the great suggestion. <laughs> yeah. And we, we need to take that seriously. As we look at the Old Testament prophecies, we need to see that they line up exactly with the Great Commission. 
Uh, it, it does not require Jesus to come down and smack the nations around. It requires the church to evangelize and then disciple mm -hmm. the nations of the world. And again, this is a covenantal act. We are to teach them and we're to baptize them and thus incorporate them into the body of Christ. And that's the job left before us. And for once, we're not going to end on, an op on a pessimistic note because that's an optimistic <laughs> note. Yes. God's We've in control. We've got a job to do. We and got a God job is in to control. Do. God is in control. He oversees the success of it, despite our efforts. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been very enlightening. Uh, do you have any recommendations for us this evening? Yeah, I think I recommended it before, but I'm going to recommend it again because now I'm actually reading it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as the waters cover the seas, millennial expectations in the rise of Anglo-American mission, 1640 to 1810. It's by James A. De Young and Young is spelled in the traditional Dutch way, J O N G. <laughs> he was actually my theology teacher at Dort. He was, I had significant disagreements with him, but this book is really good. Uh, it's what it sounds like. He goes back to the time of the Puritans and looks at how their understanding of prophecy led to a rise in missionary activity. I knew all that. What I didn't know as I've been reading it is how lukewarm Christians, Reformed Christians, Presbyterian Christians, Calvinistic Christians, Christians in general, were to missions and evangelism prior to this period. It just really, they, they talked about it now and then, and then forgot it. They just really did not get this idea of, oh, we're supposed to go win other people to Christ. People who don't speak our language and don't look like us and don't dress like us. And and maybe even people the next town over who <laughs> don't quite have our dialect and don't speak like it's it, it was all about purifying the church and our commitment to one another is the the the, the covenanters and the congregationalists and it was kind of turned in on one another. The Scotch Presbyterians were a little stronger, as you know, the Scots are for the Scots. And, <laughs> but there really still wasn't initially a great deal of zeal. It was it was came as kind of a, oh really, we should evangelize, we should fund missions, huh? That's an idea. It, it was it's like reading an alternate history from another universe. <laughs> like you're kidding. The church was never this stupid, was it? <laughs> yeah, apparently it was. And the thing that really began to push it was what uh, Dr. DeYoung calls millennialism or chiliism, which is a vague word for Jesus is going to do something in this thing called the millennium, which may be a literal thousand years or maybe it isn't. It may happen after he comes or may lead up to it. In other words... The church is going to evangelize, and a lot of people are going to say, we just don't quite know how or why or uh, God's timetable. And what eventually would be postmillennialism and, and um, premillennialism both came out of this. But at this point, it was simply, God's planning on saving a lot of people. Did you know that? The prophets say so. Oh, and, and he wants you involved. Oh, <laughs> would you like to give some money toward this? No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sure, uh, I'll give some money. You want to go serve in the mission field? That's an idea. Uh, <laughs> it's it's it is fascinating to see that the church has not always been what it is today. With all the failings the church has today, this is not one of them. Any almost any denomination. I'm sure there are exceptions, but most of the the bigger denominations, even the independents and the the neighborhood churches and all that. They get that we're supposed to be evangelizing our, the people we know and we're supposed to be supporting foreign missions. Mm -hmm. And it's not an option. It's not for special people. It's not something we could do or can't do. This, this is part of the church's ministry. It's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And to see that there was this period in time where people didn't even remotely get that and then began to be swayed by the vision that the prophet set before the church to finally get involved is kind of a... Um, paradigm shift for me, I guess, of, uh, where uh, church history is concerned. Hmm. You know, the, the, we've always said, well, the reformers didn't reform, be, uh, didn't evangelize because they were busy, which is true enough, because <laughs> they persecuted. And yet when the first generation went away, nobody picked up the torch. There were, there were a few exceptions here and there. 
but it's not that big push. And what was there began to die down. Sitting on a hill, yeah, for England, it took a big push to get the Puritans interested in evangelizing the Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, not till uh, John Eliot's work did it really begin to click. And then when he was gone, it faded again. Anyway, it's a, it, it, <laughs> it's a, it's written kind of like, well, it's a master's, master's or doctoral thesis, probably a doctoral thesis. And it's, uh, so it's not <laughs> fun afternoon reading, but it's, if you're interested in these things, the connection, the practical implications of, of eschatology and prophecy. You know, so often we're told, well, it's not a salvation issue. Well, parts of it are, parts of it are not maybe your salvation, but are we going to go work on saving those people over there? Or are we convinced that there's no point because God doesn't plan to save many people anyhow? Hmm. What's your recommendation? I'm going to recommend The God Particle, which is hmm. a play by James Carey. It's available, a filmed version of it is available on Vimeo, I want to say. Um, but it's a romantic comedy about an Anglican vicar who meets a quantum physicist. <laughs> and um, they don't exactly hit it off. Or rather, she doesn't think they've hit it off because she spent the entire time railing at how she thinks faith is stupid. And <laughs> he says, well, I thought we had rather a nice discussion. Um, <laughs> but it's quite funny, very enjoyable. It's not too long. I think it's about an hour and a half. Um, but David and I watched it a few evenings ago, and it was it was just really fun. Um, lots of bookish references. <laughs> you can tell that the vicar is someone who's been educated in the um, British bookish way. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Gilbert. Um, and he says, I know what you're thinking. I must be named after G.K. Chesterton. And the quantum physicist wasn't thinking that at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, it's a good time. It's uh, funny. I went for Gilbert and Anne of Green Gables, but you know, and oh. then Gilbert and Sullivan. And <laughs> I forget that the G stands for Gilbert. Okay, very good. Where, where did you access this? You can find it on Vimeo, and if we have show notes, I'll put it there. Um, <laughs> okay. it'll, it'll not be free. I think it's uh, $10 or something to watch. Okay. Well, that's nice. Nice to warn people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Uh, thanks to Brian Broom, who is usually here. Thanks to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Thanks to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join the number of our financial supporters, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always send us an email. That's the best way. Uh, you can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.